So there's three major factions that we were presenting today. One is the Hawaiian Civic Club, so Association of Hawaiian Civic Club, their website. They have information regarding all of the presentation that you have today. OHA, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, same thing if you go to their website. And uh, Department of Interior has a lot of information too. If you need any of those links, we'll be happy to provide them. Please email us and uh, we'll send you the links, we'll send you the the URL addresses, and uh, we'll make sure that you have information. But 19th of August is coming very quickly, and we need you to step up and exercise your voice. So, anybody have questions? Let's see, oh, there it is. Uh, my name is Hanalei Pi'imanu Vieira, um, and my question is for Benton, and probably, Keanu, you can respond to this also, uh, and it has to do with the Hawaiian Civic Club. Um, you know, your presentation, Benton, was, was great, but it very much stated what Suli Stroud and uh, everyone else with Hawaiian Civic Club puts out, which is federal recognition, federal recognition, federal recognition. And yet, the Hawaiian Civic Club has also passed a resolution to accept and, and acknowledge that the 1893 executive agreements are legal and binding. So help me understand how those two can exist at the same time. Uh, as, yeah, if others want to chime in, they can. Um, the Association of Hawaiian Civil Club is made up of many clubs. It's made up of councils. The clubs make up councils. Councils make up the association. The association holds yearly conventions where individual clubs um, uh, submit resolutions on various topics affecting Native Hawaiians. They range, normally they're grouped into um, those of education, health, rights, economic development, um, and honor, um, honorees, um, kupuna who have passed away. Um, so a variety of resolutions are, are discussed in convention, debated in committees, and then brought forth to the plenary for a final vote. Though those that are voted in the major, uh, majority are passed by the resolution um, and sent to various uh, public officials. If it's related to the federal government, they're sent to senators or heads of agency, federal agencies. If they uh, pertain to uh, state legislature, they're sent to various um, heads of committees or senators or representatives. If they're um, honoring a kupuna who have passed away, they're sent to families of those kupuna. Um, so there, were, there was um, at least one, I know, uh, resolution that did recognize um, the executive agreements I believe it requested the state legislature to look into this. Um, so that resolution was passed by the convention. It requested the legislature to look into it. And I heard in committee that particular, uh, the, so, so our resolution became a bill introduced in the state legislature. Um, that bill was uh, discussed in their committee and it died in committee. So yes, our, the Association Wide Civil Club had passed a resolution to look into the question of executive agreements, and um, legislature took it up. They didn't find anything, and, and the, the bill died in, in, in committee. That, that's what I know about that particular resolution. Um, there may be others that that, um, that uh, the convention passed talking about executive agreements, but I don't know of any others. I, I do know that there are a number of resolutions that um, supported to get more education out to the community, uh, community um, in, the, um, in the 90s, uh, supported the Akaka Bill in, in its various um, um, uh, modifications and amendments. Um, and, and those were also discussed in our committee at convention and passed and voted by majority, um, passed out a resolution and, and, and sent out. And so the support that Suli talks about, I think, is based upon the, the 
numbers of resolutions that have passed our convention in the majority that have supported federal recognition, recognizing one, yes, that we have had you know, resolutions that passed uh, our um, convention that looked at uh, executive agreements, as well as still today, we have individual clubs who take varying positions on this question uh, that's being offered by the Department of Interior. Um, so that's fine. It's just that the association, as the large organization, is taking the majority, um, uh, siding with the majority in, in recognizing in federal recognition. Okay. okay, actually, I might be able to provide some clarification. Um, I'm a club member of Kalei Maleli Ihoin Civic Club. Uh, the delegate, uh, the president at that time, Lynette Cruz, Dr. Lynette Cruz, introduced that resolution. Now, as a member of the Hawaiian Civic Club, I actually drafted that resolution. I was asked to draft it. Okay, so I know exactly what that resolution is all about, but what, I wasn't a delegate there. Now, it didn't originally pass out of the committee until it was reworded. And Judge Walter Heen, he's a former appellate judge, uh, Circuit Court of Appeals in Hawaii, and attorney Keone Agard worked with Lynette to try to put language in there so it could pass. And the only thing they added to it was adding Native Hawaiians. They didn't change the text. They added Native Hawaiians in it, and then it passed. Now, the, the intent of the resolution was merely to acknowledge the executive agreements, and we had all the evidence of it, the executive agreements that exist. So. The resolution was to acknowledge the executive agreements because it happened. It's like acknowledging the Constitution of the United States. Now, when it was taken to Representative Mele Carroll, well, that came out to what is called House Concurrent Resolution 107 in 2011. Representative Mele Carroll requested me to assist her in drafting, drafting that legislative resolution. So I was in, intimately involved in both. Now, when it, it, it was intended to go through three committees in the House and then three committees in the Senate because it's supposed to be a concurrent resolution, both. The intent of the legislation was to create an investigative committee to look into the status of the executive agreements and the impact that it has on state of Hawaii legislation. That's what, the, that, that's what, it, that's what was worded. And they would do this by um, uh, having almost like subpoena powers to a certain degree to call in people to give testimony, make a report, and submit it to the next legislature. That's, that was the intent. It went to the Hawaiian Affairs Committee. It passed. And, resolution, and testimony was given. And it was actually testimony was given by Su Lee as president of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs in support of, invest, of establishing an investigative committee. Then it moved over to the um, Judicial Committee. Yeah, I think it was a Judicial Committee. I think it was. And it passed. And then it's supposed to go to the Finance Committee, the final committee in the House before it moves over to the Senate. Keith Agaron, a representative from Maui, played politics with Representative Mele Carroll, who's from Maui as well. And he refused to put it on the agenda. And that's where the game was played. So it basically failed not to pass the finance committee. It couldn't even get in the committee because they're playing politics. There was a deliberate move to prevent it from going through. That's what it was. Now, wouldn't you think, and I shared this with Mele, wouldn't you think that you want an investigative committee to look into the matter and get people who are qualified to speak to the issue versus playing politics of trying to get it past one of the last committees in the House in order for it to get to the Senate? But it was also told to her, because I was there in her office when this was happening, Senate senators didn't want it either. And some of them were Hawaiian. So you can see what happens when you start asking right questions. I think people are afraid what they're going to find out. But it doesn't take away the fact of the, the acknowledgement. So the difference between the association's resolution supporting federal recognition, federal recognition is a process by which to do something. And the reason why so many resolutions were passed to support federal recognition, because one, it didn't work with the Akaka bill, it didn't work with this, it didn't work with that, so they keep supporting federal recognition. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you pass a resolution acknowledging the executive agreement, what you're saying is that exists. You're not saying, let's, 
let's see if it exists. It exists, and Judge Walter Heen was part of that. In fact, Judge Walter Heen retired. He read my dissertation. He actually attended my dissertation defense. So he knew exactly what was entailed in that, and I was pleasantly surprised to know that he assisted Lynette to add Native Hawaiian. And it was interesting. All you had to do was add Native Hawaiian, then it passes. That's the only change that happened to the resolution. So I just wanted to clarify. Uh, there is nothing wrong with the resolution for recognition of federal recognition, and there's nothing with the resolution acknowledging the executive agreements. There isn't. It's what everybody agreed to in, 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 in the convention. What I would say, though, is there is a priority between the two resolutions. The Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs should put priority on the executive agreements to support the federal government to show evidence that the kingdom doesn't exist. Because if the kingdom doesn't exist, it renders the executive agreement resolution void, doesn't apply. Now what you have is the resolutions for federal recognition to proceed. So it's not either or, it's prioritizing. That, that, that's all this is. So I, I'm not here advocating yes or no, no or yes, up or down. I'm just providing information on my recommendations as a political scientist, because it's my area of expertise. I would recommend that you might want to answer these questions first before answering these questions. You know, and again, it's information. You know, um, Brenton, you said, uh, Benton said you were a, a biologist. Yeah. See, he's real science. I'm social science. <laughs> <That's true. I laughs> but you know what we have in common? It's called, I take in political science, as he takes as a scientist, a scientific approach when you look at something. It's called evidence base. And in order to understand the evidence, meaning, it has to be falsifiable. You know, evidence has to be falsifiable. And if you notice, what I'm talking about here is falsifying before promoting. Yeah. So when you falsify, you need, you need to show why it isn't. Now, what's, more, what's very important is when you look at evidence, or what we call facts, you have to apply the appropriate theoretical framework to understand that. Another way of saying it, you don't explain a football game by using baseball theory. Same facts, <laughs> but no, that's not a touchdown. No, that's not a home run. <laughs> you know, and if all you know is baseball, but you're actually watching a football game without knowing it, you're gonna get frustrated. See, because what theory does, theory helps explain phenomenon without which you wouldn't be able to explain it. So what we need to learn is football, because this is a football game. But some of us are still using baseball rules <laughs> in this game. That's why it's very important that he and I, both social science and real science, it's called uh, falsifiable information. Yeah? That's the issue. Yeah? And I think that's what I was trying to share. Yeah? So what Benton shared with the Association of Hawaiian Civic Club, that was based upon information that they had at a particular time. Now what you have is more information, more evidence, so it has to readjust. That's why whenever you, you, you come up with your hypothesis, yeah, you don't try to prove it. You test it. Because <laughs> when you prove it, all you're doing is reinforcing the hypothetical, and you start cherry-picking. It's called confirmation bias. Yeah? And then you know how you maintain confirmation bias? By selectively taking things to confirm your own bias? You need to apply communal reinforcement. So everybody can believe the same thing. <laughs> and you start feeding it. That's very non-scientific. Yeah? That's why skeptics come out and look at things, and hey, let's see the evidence. So what I'm, I'm a proponent of, and these resolutions are indicators that we're starting to ask the right questions, and that's good. Not that we may have all the answers, but at least we're beginning to ask the right questions. Aloha. Um, my name is Auntie D. Most people know me by Auntie D. Uh, D. Sito, and I also graduated from Mehamea School. I didn't learn all the stuff that he knows. <laughs> I know. But my question is, we have this that you guys want us to sign and to give our opinion of. Who set the deadline? I mean, really, who set the deadline? Because how many Hawaiians know? I mean, my mom lives at home still. 
My sister lives at home. She never hear nothing about this. So how can we sign something and make it pass when our family at home has no clue? So how are they addressing that? Um, one comment you could make is to extend the comment period. That is a comment. It's a comment that has been offered by at least two organizations, one of them being, being Papa Olo Lokahi, the Native Hawaiian um, Health Organization. They've asked for an extension of at least one more month. Um, so that would be a valid comment. So um, that's good. Yeah. How, many, how long has this been in existence that they knew about this that we needed to sign so that we can help educate the Hawaiians. It, it came out quickly in, in late June, and they started the um, they came out with the press release, and then the meetings were set up almost a, a week thereafter, going through all the islands. Um, and if you've seen some of the videos from those meetings, um, there's a lot of uh, frustration that people felt that they weren't um, included. They were asking the same questions that you did. How, how did this come about? Why didn't I know about it? My family doesn't know about this. Um, and there's so many Hawaiians on the continent. And then here, exactly. They had, I mean, they had meetings planned here, but not, not in California. This kind of stuff should have been presented because that's where the Hawaiians are. And they don't know about this. And I feel bad because yeah. I have kupuna that this is going to help. I have, you know, mo'opuna that I know this will help. But well, there, there was information know, okay, provided so at the whole Laulea. Um, it was in their booklet. And there was even a table with some information on, on the um, proposed rulemaking. Um, so they at least did hit one festival here, here in Southern California. I know, but there's... But, but it wasn't, it was, a, you know, some civic club members that did that. I'm just saying. 49. Yeah, 49. Oh, yeah, 49. I forgot. <laughs> That's right. We have a nation. There. Until they get the evidence. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, Auntie, to answer the question as well. I'm going to take it back. Okay, so... A lot of times, see, I used to be a social worker with Queen Liliuokalani Children's Center, you know. So I'm a kind of a jack of all trades. I fire artillery. I work with Hawaiian men in behavior. <laughs> I'm a political scientist, and I'm a dad. You know? Now, what we need to do, always keep in mind, is that when you talk about a misunderstanding, you know, okay, we have to back up to get in perspective. That's the key. Whenever you go through problem solving and ho'oponopono, that's what it's all about. It's backing up from the tree to see the forest. Because okay? if your face is in the tree, you cannot see the forest, and you may mistake the tree for being something else because you can't see it. you got to get in perspective. Move back. So what I'm going to try to do is move back. Let's, let's not, I need to get you away from this, this thing called rule, rulemaking. I'm not saying throw it away, just step back. Take a look at it. Okay, so let me ask these questions. I'm going to see if you guys understood what was presented. Who is running the rulemaking? Department of Interior. And it's a bona fide entity. It's not an occupier because we're in America. If it was in Hawaii, it's the occupier. No, the Department of Interior is legal. It's just where they're at. So the Department of Interior, there's nothing wrong with them. They are really government officials, for sure. <laughs> but it's the Department of Interior. Now, the Department of Interior is part of what branch of government? Executive. Executive branch of government. Okay? They're not part of the judicial, which interprets laws. They're not part of the Congress or legislature that makes laws. They're part of the executive branch that executes laws. Okay. Now, in order to execute laws, you have departments that are part of the president's cabinet. Depar uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary of Defense, yeah? uh, Secretary of Interior, Secretary of uh, Department of State. Okay. These are departments who are part of the executive branch. And their job is to enforce law, not to interpret. Of the branches of government, I mean, sorry, of the agencies or, 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 or departments within the executive branch, can you tell me which agencies have the ability to represent the United States in foreign countries or outside of the United States? State Department is one. That's why Secretary Kerry is going to be in on Oahu at East West Center on August 13th. He's dealing with Russia. Okay, so the State Department. Who else? 
Department of Defense, military. And that's what I came under. Okay. So ambassadors fall under the State Department. Military comes under the Department of Defense. They go abroad. The Interior Department, the Department of Justice, the Department of Interior have no capacity under U.S. law to go outside of U.S. territory. They don't. So let's look at the proposed rule change. The Department of Interior is asking a question. I think before you can answer the question, I think you need to ask the question first. Is Hawaii a part of the United States? No. Can you show me that the Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't exist? Because then I would know it's part of the United States, so I can now talk to the Interior Department. Because, because Hawaii is separate from the United States, then who should I really be talking to? The Department of State or the Department of Defense. That's how it works. That's basic civics. <laughs> civics 101. In poli sci, we call it poli sci 130, American politics, intro to American politics. So this whole process is operating on the assumption that the Hawaiian Kingdom was overthrown. And now you have evidence to now have the presumption that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. So the burden is on the United States. So you know that letter that you folks have? My recommendation in order to, it, and it's just following procedures. Ask the Department of Interior, when are they going to provide a formal request to the Office of Legal Counsel, Department of Justice, to show evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom does not exist under international law and that it is the 50th state of the United States? Because if it is frivolous, then they should have no problem coming up with that opinion. Real quick. Did you know they haven't said anything yet? And it's not just them now. It's the entire history that we have with the United States since 1898. So, that's, so, so the idea of being educated and knowledgeable is not necessarily to know the answers, but to know how to ask the right questions. That's the key. So you're not trying to promote the kingdom exists. It is presumed to exist. I can't change that. Can you please tell me it doesn't exist? So now you become no different than Dr. Kamana Opono Crab asking the right questions. And why Dr. Kamana Opono Crab asked? Risk management. Due diligence. That's all. He didn't pick a side. He didn't say, I'm for the kingdom. I'm against the kingdom. He said, can you show me evidence that the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist? Because for you folks here in America, you folks are in a foreign country. Because the Hawaiian Kingdom exists. So that opinion that you are hoping to get through that letter to Esther Kiaina is going to benefit you because that will determine whether or not you're an alien living in California or you're an American. Because if you're an alien, then now you get asked the next question. What laws protect me now? And that's when you get into the Treaty of 1849. Because the Treaty of 1849 protects U.S. nationals living in Hawaii, and Hawaiian subjects living in America. It says it. So you see how questions can get you to different places. So it's not like, I want to be an American. Well, don't you think a lot of Mexicans think like that too when they cross the border? I want to be an American? That doesn't make you an American. You have to have evidence that you're an American. And right now the evidence is showing that you may not be. Now, now your children though, or grandchildren who were born in America, they're American because that's natural born. But they're also Hawaiian subjects by parenting. So that's dual citizen. Yeah. So this is, again, not an issue of picking and choosing. It's just clarifying. I remember the last time I was here in San Diego with the Association of Hawaiian, the Mainland Council. Auntie, right there. He was like, what? Aliens. <laughs> we helped the Mexicans and the aliens to become American. And now Auntie found out, I may not even be American. <laughs> but that's. Those are good questions. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with living in America. Yeah? Nothing wrong with it. Got to follow the laws. Well, if you live in Hawaii, you got to follow the laws too. The fact that we don't know the laws doesn't excuse you not following it. <laughs> but we have an excuse. But see, now you folks don't have an excuse because now you know. Prior to that, you didn't know. But it's a very exciting time to start asking questions and to start communicating with each other. And don't be afraid to talk this language. It's okay. It's okay. More questions, please. Oh, 
Palayo, uh, I got a question in regards to uh, setting up this uh, uh, thing here. What's the difference between this and the American Indians uh, thing that they, uh, the benefits that they, we as a Hawaiian would get out of this? Comparing the American Indian, compare the uh, situation for the Hawaiian community today. And not only the Hawaiian community, any children half born with American, uh, Vietnamese, Haole, and everything that come in, what percentage of that will they recognize as they're going to be part of this Hawaiian uh, portion? What's the quantum that you guys are going to uh, uh, come up with? That, that's unknown, and it's going to be up to the Hawaiian, Hawaiian community to decide through a convention and a constitution. All this is asking right now is should the Department of Interior change its rules to recognize a government-to-government -government relationship with Native Hawaiians. It's still going to be up to the Hawaiians to get together to have a constitutional convention and come up with a constitution and send that to the federal government and saying this is what our government is based upon, this particular constitution. So those particular questions that you ask about um, who can be part of uh, that nation, what type of benefits they're going to receive, um, those will have to be spelled out in the Constitution, and that's yet to be determined. That's not, that's not really the question that the interior is asking right now. Well, I would ask, but, but to educate the Hawaiians at heart, or the true Hawaiians, you've got to educate them also, too, to tell them not, because they cannot make a decision. I, I bet you if you go back to uh, Nanakuli, Waimanalo, uh, and all these people, Hawaiians, they basically don't knew, know what, what's, what's coming out. You gotta educate those people back in Hawaii also too. And coming up here right now, we are just as neglect. We don't know too much about what's happening back in the island. But you have to educate the, the people up here and also the people back in Hawaii. And that's an important point that you have to bring up on that. And if you don't have the manao of going out and telling them what to do, I don't think you guys are gonna get all of the support from all of the Hawaiians or and that, that's my, my that's my question on this with regards to this. To advance this out there, you got to go out and educate the people. I, I know you guys are doing it right here, but you know. But from what I read in the paper, the OHA paper, and nothing comes out like this on, on the thing. So to tell us, but you got to educate the Hawaiian people on the thing to get this thing done. If you want to do right, because you know I, I'm, I'm 87 years old. 85 years old, and I still don't know today where we come from on the thing. So, and then we've been fighting this all these years. I went to Kamehameha School. I went to San Jose State. I mean, I got my degree and everything, but still yet, we, we haven't moved yet one foot ahead of time. That's why I want to say this other thing, that you guys have to go back again and push for this thing. Educate the, the, my generation and the new generation coming up. I know you guys try to do that now, but you have to do more than that on things just by doing that. That's my, my thought. Actually, Uncle, you're absolutely right. It's education. That's key. It's education, not pick a side. So we're dealing with 121 years of lies. You can't fix it in one day. You have to be taught. And a lot of this stuff is what we're doing at the university which has started already since 2001. I can say 2001, it started. It is permeating out to the people. Uh, people are being educated. What we also are taking advantage of with education, because it's not just people in Hawaii, people throughout the world have to get educated. Remember those treaties that you saw in the video? Did you know I went to, I was invited to give a presentation to Swiss diplomats at University of Zurich uh, this past November. Why did they want to get educated? Not because of Hawaiians, because of the treaty with Switzerland and Hawaii, because the Hawaiian kingdom exists, that means the treaty still exists. And you know what's piquing their interests? Money, banking, vested interests, oh yeah. So it's not just here, and also with all those treaties that Hawaii had, we also had 90 embassies and consulates all over the world. Did you know we had an embassy in Belgium? Yeah. So that means there's diplomatic records there but when you're in Belgium, you speak French. What about the records in French? What about the, the embassies or the consulates in Sweden? You gotta know Swedish language. 
What about Spain? They don't know Spanish. So what we're starting to realize is this is huge. We're talking country. We're not talking natives. The natives were the majority of the country, and they're very educated. So when you start to look at our history, it's good to try to understand who our people were. Joseph Navahi. Who is Navahi? Navahi was a Hawaiian statesman from Hilo. Served in the Hawaiian legislature from 1872 to 1892. In 1893, 1892, he also served as Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was an attorney. He was a painter. Did you know he was honored by Queen Lili Oklan in her book? He was a patriot. He was the one who established Hui Aloha Aina, the Patriotic League, who were responsible for the 21,000 signatures. But did you know Navahi was killed by insurgents? He contracted tuberculosis by was thrown in jail because he was a threat. He traveled to California to try to get well. And you know why he came here? Not only to get well, he came here to look at the banking system to get ideas to bring home. We don't think like that anymore. James Kaulia, David Kalau Kalani, even the Haoli's, William, William Richards. Who is William Richards? This is not a Haoli thing. This is a Hawaiian thing. So that's part of the education. It's crucial. But what we also have the luxury today, we got social media. That is another uh, uh, a tool for education. We've got blogs. We've got websites. We've got Twitter. You know, when I was in uh, Geneva, and I gave that presentation to the Swiss diplomats, and there was also a school for diplomats at Zurich University, so they're training students from Spain, France, and all them. After the presentation, one of the ambassador's wives came up to me and said, what about the young people? Are you concerned about them? And I look at her like, oh, what are you talking about? Now imagine, this is their level of diplomacy. That's the highest level with countries with representing Switzerland. She goes, the young people, when they get wind of what actually happened, it's going to be an uprising. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you mean like the Arab Spring in Egypt? And she goes, yes. I go, little different in Hawaii. We, we're not that angry. <laughs> <laughs> but over there, they got to fight fire with fire because Mubarak, oh, he was doing some bad things. So that's something unique to Egypt. And I said, our people need to be educated. Our young people are being educated at the university, at the high schools, and they're getting it. They're not looking at how do we participate. What's my role in Hawaiian government, not whether or not we are a government? What's my role? Am I going to be an attorney? Am I going to be a, a business person? Am I going to, what are you going to do for your country, not what your country can do for you? Sound familiar? Yeah. Kennedy. <laughs> so those, those issues all come into play. But interesting, Hawaii's unique. We're not like the Arab Spring, but the Arab Spring has something that is now being used in Hawaii. It's called Twitter. <laughs> it's called Facebook. Communication is quick. We just got to make sure the information is correct. Yeah? So if you can present bad information, I mean good information, that means somebody can present bad information. So it still goes into the comprehension of the information and not necessarily the reciting of facts. Comprehension. Because yeah, anybody can read any, something. I, I can read a law book. Next question, did I comprehend what I read? <laughs> little different. That's where you need, might have some training. So I advocate education. Crucial. Education, education, education. And King the III declared that his kingdom is the kingdom of the Palapala. He did. That was the model. And you know what Palapala meant? Not people. Palapala, reading and writing. Because reading and writing being the foundation of the Hawaiian kingdom is precisely why our people in the 1890s was able to be unified in thought because they had newspapers distributed throughout the islands informing them of things that are happening. Dr. Puakea Nogomayer, a professor at the University of Hawaii, his doctoral thesis was on the Hawaiian newspapers. Yeah. And you know what he found? Something unique. The newspapers that were used in the kingdom era was like an internet. A person from Niihau pulls up, gets deli uh, uh, delivered a, a paper called Kamakai Nana. Somebody's writing something from uh, Na'alehu, Big Island, about something. Did you know that they would respond, letter to that person, not letter to the editor, le letter to that person, they're communicating. This is before the telephone. That's why you can gather 21,000 signatures in such a short period of time from September to December. We can't even get 1,000 today. 21,000, and they knew where they were coming. They were communication. So 
that speaks to literacy. That speaks to comprehension. But it also speaks to our kupuna who knew their kuleano, but also they knew others who had kuleano. So if Joseph Navahi, who they knew had a reputation of being that person, I understand what you say. I will do what I need to do to get something done. I don't have to replicate or be like you. A lot of times our people tend to think we've got to be together. No, no. You've got to be alone. What I saw with this information, this information in my experience, it maximizes kuleano. It maximizes it. It maximizes your responsibility. If you're an attorney, be a better attorney. You're going to be a businessman, be a better businessman. You're a teacher, be a better teacher. Teach the right stuff. But as it maximizes kuleano, it also maximizes accountability to that kuleano. So if I see you say something, I've got to correct you. We're not colonized. We occupy it. Yeah? That's how it works. So education begins here. We all have to fill our gourd with water. <laughs> yeah? Don't worry about filling everybody else's gourd. Fill your gourd first. Yeah? And when you fill with water, guess what? You don't swish. You're grounded. Yeah? And it's solid. So that's a means by which we have to keep in mind education. We need to drink water. It's okay. Even drinking the bitter water. Yeah? Yeah. Even the bitter water. Come in and say, for the battle of Nu'uanu. Go for young chiefs and drink the bitter waters. Inui kavai ava ava. For there's no turning back. <laughs> so, again, just to reiterate, education is key. Let me say something. My name is Eric Keller, and I'm from Kyokoha. But, uh, can you? So you talk about education, you talk all about this. Brilliant things. Within this room, this is the first time I ever attended something like this. Papa, thank you to this, this man, uncle. He has experience working in retired engineering. I, I didn't have a, a one sixteen of his education. Okay? And, I, and I'm, I'm Pew Hawaiian. I'm Pew Hawaiian. Okay? My family is one. So I get my children. I married a Howley so I could get a hit. I thought anybody, to all my friends back in, in Kyokoha, I marry a Howley so I can get ahead. I did. I do. I got my American dream. Now, I want to man out from you. I want to be like you. I want to, well, like I say, when I grow up, I want to be like you. Where can my children, children's children can get all that from you? Give me that. Tell me where. That's what we're looking for. The, the one thing that we needed to do. Tell me where to go, and I'll find you. The one thing we needed to do when we got back from The Hague was we had to institutionalize this information. You know, that way it doesn't look like a political group making a comment and pushing an agenda. We had to institutionalize it was crucial. That began at the University of Hawaii. It began there. It doesn't stay there. Okay? It began there. So classes are being taught at the University of Hawaii. People can take online classes. Uh, the Department of Education, teachers are now being trained to teach. This past summer, I was retained by the Department of Education to, tra to train uh, 16 school teachers, uh, intermediate and high school, who teach Hawaiian history on developing curriculum using my book, Ua Maukea, Okaina, no, no, Ua Maukea, Sovereignty Endures, which is a watered-down version of my dissertation. So that book is required reading. Um, I spent 16 hours with them, and I got to tell you, it's not easy to teach. It's not. A lot of this deals with what is called pedagogy. Okay? Pedagogy is how to teach. So what we covered with the, the, the teachers, these teachers, question I pose, how do you teach this information when a person in your class is the son of somebody who claims to be King Commitment of 10? I'm serious, that's a real issue. And you know what? One of the teachers said, I got one of them. And she was from Kauai was in the tent, but I'm not going to say exactly because then you know who I'm talking about, so I just use it as a, <laughs> as a catch-all phrase. Commitment to tent. So how do you teach that student without alienating a student and making that student feel bad and putting the father in a position of he's wrong? That came up. Those are real issues. So we got into how you focus on history to explain how the constitutional system works. What is the constitutional monarchy? How that there is a provision in Hawaiian law, and I'm sure you folks didn't know this one. There's a provision in Hawaiian law that says no one shall sit upon the throne, be a noble or an elected representative who has been convicted of an infamous crime 
insane or an idiot. Oh, I like that. And that's our kupuna who made that, not me. I'm just citing Article 24, Constitution of 1864. I think other countries should adopt that provision. <laughs> it's a means of impeachment. <laughs> but it shows you the depth of it. Now, when you start to walk the child up, then the child is focused more on the history and not on the dad. And then now the child can now help the dad to understand. So now it's another form of education, very unconventional. So you're also teaching the child how to teach. One thing I learned in the Army, train to train, uh, before you train the soldiers, train the trainers. What I took to the DOE, teach the teachers before they teach the students. Yeah? And then once you teach the students, then the students teach the, teach the students. It goes to every level. So this also is not just formal education that you get at the institution. It also includes in your homes. You guys reading books. Like Uamauke, I highly suggest you folks get Uamauke here, okay? And uh, the, the website can be provided, Lono. Okay, well, it can be provided. Okay. Now, for those who, okay, quickly, it's called Pua Foundation, P-U-A Foundation dot org. It's a publisher back home. They provide the book. $35, you get it in the mail. Yeah. It's not, you're not buying it from me, you're buying it from the publisher. That's required reading. So Pua Foundation dot org. And did you know also this education is not limited to our people who are in the public and in the community. It also includes educating our people who are incarcerated, prison. That's our people too. So in fact, I, was, uh, I taught two classes already every year at the women's prison. And we use Ua Mauke'il as a book. Now, the women who were in my class range from uh, convictions of petty theft to double murder. And you never, you couldn't tell. They're people. And a lot of the crimes of the women that were serious was actually crimes of passion because the husband was beating them up. You know, so these kind of, and these, and these are Hawaiians. Actually, this one auntie was from Kyoka. So what I found when, they, when, when I presented the history to them, what came from them was that they learned the history to better themselves. And all of a sudden, they told me that Queen Lili Okalani was a role model. This is what you do when you don't resort to violence. That's how they took it. So that's a different form of education that was taking place. So I just wanted to say, Uncle, education is at every level. And when I talk, if I'm talking to my cousins from Nalo, hey, bro, let me try to break it down. Or if I'm talking to arbitrators in The Hague, excuse, let, uh, let me explain this use, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, we, so remember, we are all mo'os, right? We're all mo'o. But we can always change color. But we cannot change shape. You adapt. Yeah, you adapt. Okay, next question, please. Aloha, my brothers and sisters. My name is Keaka Keali Kahiki Iaukea. Almost, I would say, I'm one of the very last of the Kahiki clans. Before we had clans instead of tribes. I don't understand where, I'm com where you guys are coming from that I've got to turn in myself into an Indian. Is Geronimo my grandfather? I don't think so. Many of us, we claim that uh, Kamehameha is our ancestors, and yes, I'm not going to doubt that at all. Many people claim to be of Kamehameha. Yes. Kamehameha had more than one wife. He had several wives, like maybe, what, 23 of them? And out of these wives, they had so many kids. And these many kids, they all claim to be Kamehameha, the next king. But by God, man, you know, how can you do this? Why do you take the fat? Why do you take the things that we have and just give it all away? And our mo'opuna stay on the beach and then even blue tent. Why is that? But first of all, I have to say no to all the first five questions. Aole, 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 ilima, aole. Thank you. <laughs> well, again, I'll just emphasize that the federal government 
recognizes Native Hawaiians politically through more than 150 policies and laws. Um, this, they don't have, they don't recognize a Native Hawaiian government right now. All this is asking, should the Department of Interior have rules to recognize a Native Hawaiian government? And what, that's still gonna be up to the Hawaiian people to, to one, come together to develop a constitution and then decide at that time whether they want to give it to the federal government or not. They can still decide to say, you know, we went through this process of electing delegates. We had, um, commu we had the um, majority of the community vote on this constitution. But, you know, we don't think this path is the right one. Um, that can be done at, at a later time. All this is asking right now is the Department of Interior is just asking, should we change our rules to allow that process if you want it? You know, still going to be up to the Hawaiians to decide whether they want to, want to walk through that door or not. We got to keep in mind that the Hawaiian Kingdom government was already established since 1839 as a constitutional system and it evolved. By 1864, the Hawaiian Kingdom had fully adopted the separation of powers doctrine. It's all in the constitution. You have courts, you have common law, judge made laws, you had all these things. So when you speak about creating a government, you have to be sure one doesn't already exist. That's the key. So it's not a matter of trying to come together to create a constitution when I know a lot of you don't even understand what is a constitution because you're going to be asking each other when you get together, well, how do we, what do we do? That's fine too. Again, education where you folks can learn it. But if the, because the government is there and the executive agreements acknowledge that, that is the crucial point. That's all there already. You know, so again, before moving to federal recognition, make sure the kingdom doesn't exist. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, that's important. Now, as far as, let me put another context here. I was, in, I was interviewed on Channel 9 News back home uh, in the morning, uh, sunrise in the morning. Steve Uriahara, in, 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 uh, he interviews me about what's going on, the DUI and everything. So I said, basically, it's like this. It's like the United States Department of Interior is in Great Britain, yeah. in Great Britain, asking Anglo-Saxons if they want to be recognized as an Indian tribe. Right? Did you know that's what it is? If because Hawaii is still another country, we're like Great Britain. So the Department of Interior in Great Britain asking Anglo-Saxons, you guys want to be recognized as a tribe? It's almost like what? First of all, how did you get here? <laughs> and what are you talking about? Because this is our country. Did you know that a lot of the testimony that was given in the 15 hearings was speaking along those lines? And it wasn't orchestrated. It was from people who were educated because people were saying, and you know what? They were generally angry. Wouldn't you be angry when you find out this whole thing's a lie? Well, you would get angry. It's called real anger. And they were saying, you know, why are you here? How you got here? Where's the treaty? You know, we're starting to ask the right question, but they're not responding. They're just taking in the information. <laughs> you know, and you know, it was brutal. Oh man, it was brutal. I'm watching, I'm like, oh. It was like watching the trustees get hit when Kamanao Pono came back and all the people in Maui was blasting all the trustees. But we got to keep things in context. Step back to look at things and arrange. Don't throw away. You know, and that's what I'm trying to point out here with what we're sharing. I'm not, we're not two opposing sides. What, what we're saying is, what I'm saying is, just make sure that you can clarify and qualify and position. This first, then that. Don't jump to, don't jump to five until you get to four. Uh -huh. And before you get to four, talk about one. And then walk forward. And it's just, ask the question. Can you, you know, please show us because I want to participate if this is for real. I'm just asking the right question. Make sense? Okay, next question, please. I'm Ryan Koo. Um, it seems to me that by answering these questions with the DOJ and the DOI, we're perpetuating this misconception that's been going on for 121 years. If what you're saying, Dr. Sai, what you're saying is, is that there still is a, a Hawaiian kingdom that exists, 
So for us to participate in this perpetuation um, by you know, telling the DOJ, well, we want to have you know, a nation to nation or a government to government relationship, then we're just adding on to the, the, the things that have been happening, the, mis, the misconception that's been going on from the beginning. So what is it that we can do as, as assuming we're a kingdom, that we're still a kingdom of Presume. 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 Exactly. Presuming. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, presuming we're still a kingdom, how do we take what Hawaii is right now, the structure that's already there that exists, the relationship that we have with an occupying nation, um, and move it to, uh, um, to being a kingdom again, to having our own government, to having our own laws, to, to people that are, are unjustly imprisoned because of the, the laws of the United States, when in actuality, the laws of Hawaii still exist. First question is, and I'm going to just say my personal manao on the DOI question. What I would recommend, just for me, again, I'm not telling you what to do. Should the Secretary of the Interior reestablish blah, blah, blah? No. Now, let me ask you no with another question. Can you show me evidence that the Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't exist through the letter that was... Uh, Dr. Sai requested of Secretary, uh, Assistant Secretary of Insular Affairs, Esther K. Aina, to provide evidence. So you're saying no, no, and this is how come. That's really simple, you know. And this idea of acquiescing, that doesn't apply to international law. Only governments can acquiesce, not people. Governments. And acquiescence creates what is called a stop, but that's a whole area of international law. Now, what is going on right now? What is foremost and what is very important is that people need to be aware of what's going on. So when you just found out that you've been kidnapped, yeah, you got to be careful how you talk about that. Otherwise, the kidnapper can shut you down, right? So you have to kind of share it. Hey, you know what, Brenton, I heard that was kidnapped, but don't say nothing yet. <laughs> and he goes, hey, Hey, no tell nobody, but I heard we, you know, we tell a Hawaiian, no tell nobody, they tell everybody. <laughs> hey, proud, no tell nobody, but somebody told me, no tell you, but I'm telling you now. It's called communication. Just say, hey, you know this. Oh, I never know that. That's the beginning of being aware. Then you start to get into the mechanics. Well, how do you then end the, how do you end the kidnapping if it's a criminal situation? Oh, we need a, a negotiator. <laughs> we need somebody who knows what they're doing so nobody gets hurt, you know? We need the police in, uh, uh, negotiator. Now, how do we take that to the next level? What's already happening that you folks don't know? Now, remember, when I say education, it doesn't mean we're all going to wake up one day and they're going to happen. When people get educated, people will do their kuleana. They will. So this is ongoing. There's a lot of things happening on international level, national level, and education. Right now, the Swiss government, the Swiss government, He's already in meetings to determine whether or not they will become a protecting power, the police negotiator. A protecting power is a party to the Geneva Conventions, in particular Geneva Convention Number no. 4, 1949, that protects civilian populations. That Geneva Convention, every country that signed it, is supposed to ensure compliance to it. And one party of the treaty can be approached by someone within the conflict, a government from the, in the conflict, to be a protecting power, to ensure compliance to the law of occupation and start negotiating, start talking. Yeah? Switzerland was actually approached to do that recently between Ukraine and Russia. Putin had all the Russian troops on the eastern border. Did you know it was the president of Switzerland that was the negotiator to get Putin to back off the troops? They, at that time, also knew that Hawaii had already had a meeting with the foreign ministry where they recognized and acknowledged diplomatically the Hawaiian kingdom because they have a treaty. They're not saying, oh, what is the U.S. going to say? No. They got to look at it for themselves. Every country is going to see it for themselves because they all have nationals. So compliance. 
But you also have to get the word out because, you know, we're not in a position to make like we Tantaran. No? You guys know Tantaran, right? You guys know where Tantaran came from? That's a local term, huh? Brother, no play Tantaran. That's not Dinandawan. You know, Tantaran. No, they had a blood, huh? Filipino dish. Dinaguan, Tinaguan, sorry. <laughs> you know, so, hey, no play Dinaguan, huh? Tantaran. Come on, you guys got to know where that came from. That's one local slang. It's not Filipino. Exactly. No, exactly. I used to say that. Okay, you know where that actually came from? From the old Superman movies. Tantaran. So when you say, no play Tantaran, no play Superman. <laughs> we are not in a position to play Tantaran. We need to find people who are Tantaran, who have expertise in these areas, and the Swiss government is one of them. So there are, that's just one example of how this needs to happen. But in the meantime, education, knowledge, talking, make, make this discussion normal. Yeah? When you talk about Hawaii being occupied, they go, oh, wait, wait, wait. They watch, oh, you know, we occupied. Now, hey, you know, we occupied. Oh, you, check this out. Go check that video, Dr. Sai, talking about this online. It's all education, but it begins with communication. And be comfortable with communicating, and it's okay. Yeah? But we have to be careful, though. You're going to be dealing with a lot of our people that have suffered from prolonged occupation. That's a reality, but that's psychological. It's not legal, and it's not political. Did you know there's a term called Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm Syndrome is where you start to... Uh, emulate or, or, or see in the eyes of the, um, the, 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 the kidnapper. Another term for that is what we got to be careful of that applies very dearly is battered wife syndrome. We start to justify why my husband is beating me. If he don't beat me, somebody else will, so I'm glad my husband's doing it. Those are real, real issues that we got to deal with. So we have to keep those things in mind so that communication is very important but also, being respectful is very important, and that's Kuliana. Yeah. Okay, we're going to have to take a break. Did you have a, have a quick question um, and a quick answer, I hope? <laughs> Kevin, I want to ask this while you're still here, <laughs> and I don't know when I'll see you again. Um, I'm American. I thought I was moving to the 50th state. Now it's a real wake-up, a real wake-up, big island. I, I'm having a hard, I'm being, I feel confused as an American. Uh, first off, hardly anybody knows about this out here at all. And then secondly, it's like, to me it's just like, why are the assets being threatened? Whose assets are they? They're the kingdom assets. Are these the crown lands and, and who's funding the tribe? And, uh, didn't everything belong in private hands in the kingdom, within the kingdom? How did how is it that the federal government did, or any representative can threaten that? And how is it that, what's going to fund this tribe? Is it going to be American taxpayers? Is it going to be the, the assets of the kingdom? You know, those, those things. And how can you expect anybody to opine about that without knowing anything? Okay. So that's not really. Okay. Federal recognition has the intent to protect assets. It does. Okay, because Doe versus Kamehameha, Rice v. Cayetano, Arakaki versus Lingo, these are court cases back home where people in America, Americans, who are from what is called colorblind America, they get funded in Hawaii to take out these institutions. And they say that Hawaiian homes... OHA is a direct violation of the 14th Amendment because this governing entity is race-based. No, it is. It is race-based. Okay, let's not get around. Let's not think it's not. It is. It is. But we didn't create it. They let us create it, and then now it's being attacked. So when these lawsuits were being filed, OHA and Kamehameha Schools was paying a lot of money to attorneys to defend them. It was like bleeding, and they needed a tourniquet monies was coming out, okay? So when they looked at the issue of federal recognition, they saw federal recognition as a means to stop the lawsuits, 
not necessarily to protect the assets, to stop the lawsuits. Okay. Now, the problem here is all of that was operating on information that they had at that particular time. So they don't think at that time, they didn't think at that time this was kingdom assets. No, they saw it as crown and government land, so-called ceded lands, and we've got to protect it, or Kamehameha lands. Only now this information is coming out, so we've we got, we got to be careful. Don't judge yesterday by today's standard. We have to keep things in context as things evolve. Now, the question then is to protect, to, to prevent lawsuits. Well, under the law of occupation, you can actually present arguments, and it's already happening with judge, with court, in the courts in Hawaii, with attorneys who are educated on this. They can shut down the court because what they can do as a defendant, let's say I'm being sued, I'm coming to schools, I'm being sued because it's race-based, equal protection clause, violating the equal protection clause. They take me to court. I'm coming to schools. I'm a defendant. Did you know that under the rules of court, you have a right to make a motion to say that this court does not have subject matter jurisdiction? It's called a Rule 12b1, Hawaii Rules of Civil Procedure or Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which means you present the evidence to show why this court doesn't exist because there's no treaty. And the burden shifts upon... The burden then shifts upon the plaintiff's attorney. He has to prove the Hawaiian kingdom was extinguished. He's got to show the treaty, which they cannot. What you just done right there is you shut, that's a means to shut down the court. So if this whole issue is really about not being sued, there are ways to do it if you apply this, this theory. So you still can address the concerns that we have, but now you're doing it using football rules because now you realize it's a football game. That's what's happening here is a collision of information because now you're having people, I would have to say, they are deliberately misinforming because I know they know. I know they know. They are deliberately misinforming. Bottom line, let's not get into tit for tat. Get the federal government, Department of Justice, for everybody's sake, to provide a legal opinion that the Hawaiian Kingdom no longer exists under international law. That simple. Let's not get into can they do this, should they do this, are we American Indians, are we not American Indians? Just hit that point. And what, whenever you have an ihe, you know, ihe is the spear. You got the tip of the spear. Let's talk about the tip, not the shaft. Yeah. Let's talk about the tip and sharpen that tip. So when that thing pukas, it pukas so quick, you don't even feel it. <laughs> That's being articulate. That is speaking with legal sophistication. That is knowing that our people have been misled for 121 years. Let's not get into the blame game. Let's just get to the answer. You know, let's not say, oh, he said, you said, I said, we all said. It's irrelevant. This is water. Show me it's not. Because if it's water and you can't show me it's Coca-Cola, then I'm going to use it. But I'm not going to sit here waiting for you to tell me it's not water. No, it is presumed to be water. And I'm drinking while you're telling me it's not. But I'm saying, this thing tastes like water. It doesn't taste like Coca-Cola. We have to be focused. My recommendation, before you move to federal recognition, ensure that the Department of Interior files a formal request with the Office of Legal Counsel, just as stated in that letter, get the opinion. And that is not picking a side, that's just asking for information. What's wrong with that? You guys afraid of what they're going to say? Let them say it. You know. And if Hawaii is the 50th state, because this is all ridiculous, come on. Then it should be real quick then. They should give it to you in one day. <laughs> with all the evidence, right? We're starting to ask the right questions. This doesn't mean you have the answers, but I can tell you, the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice is the authority to answer the question. Dr. Kamanaut Pono Crab was actually told by the State Department, who he was in communication with in Washington, D.C., that he said the Office of Legal Counsel, they can make an opinion showing that the Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't exist. And they told him, yes, they are capable of doing that. Okay, <laughs> at least we're finding out which door to walk through. <laughs> That's the key. Does that make sense? It's just prioritizing, not canceling out. Because it does, uh, you know, ho'omanavanui. Did you know ho'omanavanui doesn't mean to be patient? Literally. Ho'o is to do something. Manavanui, manava is time, nui is a, is a lot. Ho'omanavanui is, is spinning your wheels. That's what ho'omanavanui me means. So by spinning your wheels, the counter is... Be patient. But it doesn't mean sit down and don't do nothing. The, the counter of Ho'omanavanui is don't waste your time on something because then you're going to be tired when you really got to do the work. That's Ho'omanavanui. 
So this is a form of ho'omanavanui. Stop wasting breath on all these things. Who said, you said, I said, we all said. Hey, just ask. Let's all, let's all get them to ask the question so we can get the answer. So we don't ho'omanavanui. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Sai, I'm going to have to consider that your closing remark. <laughs> Um, no, I, I think I pretty much uh, said before, um, it is closing on August 19th, this um, um, proposed uh, rulemaking. Uh, again, Department of Interior is just asking, should we change our rules, sort of opening a door for us to recognize the Native Hawaiian government? We recognize other governments from other indigenous cultures in the United States, but not, not with the Native Hawaiians. Should we change our rules to allow that, yes or no? Um, and then if yes, they ask some other questions, how that should be done, how they should recognize it. Um, it's still going to be up to the Hawaiian community to, to, to meet, to come together, to discuss what type of government they want that's going to give them the best benefit. Mahalo. Okay, our next presenter is here. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break and um, give her an opportunity to set up. And please keep asking questions.